we're going to uh, move on to uh, our next topic. As I said last time, we uh, we've finished now with the forcing of uh, vibration systems. So now we're going to move on to kind of like a new topic. And in a couple of the in a couple of the uh, previous lectures, I've mentioned that the model that we use of a mass spring and damper is not necessarily always physically what you're modelling. Um, so in your lab, for example, you were using beams to model the vibrations. Um, so you had a physical beam, but actually we're modelling the vibrations using mass spring damper ideas. So in this uh, lecture, we look at that in a little bit more detail and try and work out how we model systems more generally. Okay? So I'll try and get this uh, lapel mic to work properly. Okay, so let's start by looking at springs, which we've already mentioned a lot in our previous lectures. And so in general, if we've got a spring that can be moved at both ends, as we mentioned before, when we looked at the uh, support input case, then uh, the force is equal to the spring constant K times X2 minus X1. So the convention is always that whatever the, wherever the spring is, the higher number is first. So if we've got x3 and x4 or whatever, it's always x4 minus x3 or whatever in, in, if the springs are in, in a system. Okay? And the idea is that that means that uh, tension should be positive. Okay? So if x2 is bigger than x1, then this should give a positive number and that will be the spring being in tension. Okay, so that's just a convention. Of course, we could define this the other way around if we wanted to, okay? But that's just the convention that is usually chosen. So the strain energy which is usually denoted as U is equal to the work done extending the spring. Work done is force times distance, isn't it? So if we drew a little sketch So formally, we define the work done, sorry, the strain energy U as an integral which if we integrate we get half K X2 squared minus X1 squared and that's the same as the area under the curve.
So in a minute, we're going to use strain energy to, um, to model systems where there's mixtures of different coordinates. But first, we're going to make a note about nonlinear springs. So for nonlinear springs, well, if we've got small oscillations, then we can, we can do what's called linearizing. OK, so what, is, what does that mean? What's a nonlinear spring? Well, it turns out that quite a lot of physical systems don't have a linear force displacement relationship. Okay, so there might be a curve in a force displace displacement relationship. And as we use the idea of stiffness, or if, if we're going to say an equivalent spring stiffness, to relate force and displacement, then this, this is not a, a straight line relationship anymore. So it's a nonlinear spring. So how do we deal with this? Well, if we consider a point on the x-axis, x star, then this is f of x star, and then we have a add a delta x, so x star plus delta x. We call this f plus delta f. Then we can do a, a Taylor series, basically. So what we can do is we can, we can get like a tangent approximation at this point x star. Okay, so we can take a, a linearization by taking the tangent of the curve through the Taylor series. And the way that works is, that, um, is usually written like this. You say that f plus delta f is equal to f of x star plus delta x. And then if you expand that out, we get f of x star plus df by dx evaluated at x star times delta x plus some higher order terms. So this thing here, h dot o dot t, that means higher order terms. Okay, so when we do a series expansion, as you know from your maths classes, it's an infinite series, isn't it? It goes on forever. But what we can see is that on the left-hand side, we've got F. On the right-hand side, we've got F. And then so we're left with this relationship delta F is equal to this derivative times delta X. OK. And so this, this thing here is some kind of um, linear stiff, uh, linearized stiffness, and in fact, it's called the tangent stiffness. Because what we do is we take the derivative of the function, and then we evaluate it at a point we're at x star. So it's the tangent of the curve at that point x star, isn't it?
So, I said that we're going to use strain energy for mixed coordinates. Let's have a look at what that means. So what are mixed coordinates? Well, in this context, they're a mixture of linear um, coordinates, meaning things moving in a straight line, and rotations. So sometimes this kind of linear is called a, a translation, isn't it? So maybe translation is a better word. So strain energy for translations is equal to the sum of all of the half kx squared components. Okay, so what it means is if we've got a whole series of different um, linear translations, x1, x2, x3, and so on, and they're all attached to springs with um, spring stiffness values, then we add all those components up in terms of their strain and energy. Strain energy for rotations It's the same thing except now we've got rotational coordinates and I've put K subscript theta okay, to, so there's, that's to emphasize K subscript theta to emphasize that this is a rotational spring stiffness Okay, and not a translational one like we've been used to. Okay, so now this is, this is like if we're having something that, and we're trying to twist something in a rotational uh, degree of freedom, then K theta is the, is the spring stiffness associated with that. So probably the easiest way to explain how this works is just to do an example to, to show you. So let's have a quick look at an example. So this is the system we're going to look at. It's a bar with a hinge at this end. Okay, so this is a Okay, and so the bar can rotate upwards with an angle theta. And then at this end, there's a spring attached. And then partway along the bar, there's another spring attached. So these have got stiffnesses K1 and K2. And there's distances in here, R1 and R2. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to represent that as an equivalent system. With just one rotational spring. Okay, and I'm going to call that K subscript EQ. 
Okay, so that's it's a rotational spring, but it's EQ means equivalent. Okay, so when we're doing our calculations, we always can trace which are real Ks and which are equivalent Ks. Okay. And the really useful thing about strain energy is that we, once we've put terms into the strain energy format, we can just equate them, okay? It doesn't matter what coordinates they're in. So for this problem, So we've got half k equivalent times theta squared is equal to a half k1 x1 squared plus a half k2 x2 squared. Okay, so what are x1 and x2? So this movement at the end of spring at K1 is X1, okay, and that movement there is X2. So now we can... What we'd like to do is come up with an expression for K equivalent, and we can do that by noticing that we can approximate X1 and X2 as the length of an arc, can't we, if the, if the angle is small. So the distance X1 is approximately the arc length, and so the radius is r1 plus r2, and theta, of course, is the angle. And the same for x2, which is approximately equal to the arc length again. In this case, it would be r2 times theta. So then we can substitute those into our strain energy equation. What do we get? We get same on the left hand side. On the right hand side we now have these extra terms. So all I, all I want to try and do on the right-hand side here is I just want to try and get this into a format where I've got something I can recognize as K equivalent. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take out the theta terms on the right-hand side. So I'll have a half, and then I'll have K1, R1 plus R2 squared plus K2 R2 squared, theta squared. So I can say from that that the K equivalent is just equal to this bracket, which is K1 R1 plus R2 squared plus K2 R2 squared for small angles. So 
So that's one example where we can use this strain energy to help us. Of course, we've now got there's several other types of scenarios that can turn up. So, beams models of springs. This is definitely something that turns up quite a lot in reality. So, for example, we can have a real system like this. So we can have a mass on the end of a cantilever beam. And then if we have a load hanging off the beam, oh, sorry, off the mass, that will cause a deflection delta. The properties are length and then E and I. So the beam properties are typically seem to be Young's modulus E, second moment of area I, and length. And we're assuming that, because we're making some approximations, we're assuming that the length goes to the centre of the mass. And our single degree of freedom system model would look something like this, wouldn't it? So what it means is that our real system could well be something like this, and we want to model the vibrations of it, we're going to use our assumed single degree of freedom system. So we need to work out how to, to get the K value, the spring stiffness, from the beam properties. Okay. turns out that um, it's already been done for you in the sense that I'm sure you've seen these derivations already for tip displacement of a cantilever so delta is equal W L cubed over 3 E I So we prefer to kind of um, represent this as a load displacement. So we would write that as W equals 3I over L cubed times delta. So that's now in the required format of force is equal to stiffness times displacement so the equivalent stiffness to leave a beam is k equiv is equal to 3 ei over l 
achieved. Of course, if we've got a different type of beam, then this will be different. So for other beams, so for example, if we've got a pinned pin beam, the central load so this is called pinned pinned So hopefully you've seen this type of thing before. This is a pinned beam, so pin on the left-hand side, pin on the right-hand side, central load. Okay, and then we have a, a stiffness, equivalent stiffness of this, 48 EI over L cubed. And you'll be pleased to know that these expressions for these different these beams and several others are in the in the formula sheet for the exam. Okay. So you can get these from a book called Blevins you want to and they're also given so quite often in exam questions you might be told that something is a, a beam with a mass you know, on it and, or something of that type and you'll be asked to do a vibration analysis. So the first step is to work out what the equivalent stiffness is. Okay, so you, you can use the formulas on the back of the exam sheet. Work out what type of beam it is, work out the equivalent stiffness and then after that then you can start doing all the vibration type analysis. So there's a couple more things to do with springs we're going to look at that arise very commonly. The first one is uh, springs in parallel. So we've already seen something similar to this in the example we looked at for the rotation. We had two springs in parallel. But assuming there's no rotation, what happens with this kind of scenario? So we have springs with K1 and K2. And then if they get stretched down by an amount delta, we apply a load W.
So this is the type of scenario we're looking at. We've got two things in parallel now, and they can only move in one translational direction. So in this case, we have that the low W is equal to K1 delta plus K2 delta. And so we can just add the two stiffnesses together, K1 plus K2 times delta. Okay, so the, the K equivalent in this case is just the sum of the two spring stiffnesses. So that's, that's pretty easy. The next case is springs in series. So what does that mean? Well, that's this type of scenario. Okay, so this is a little bit more difficult to deal with. So now we've got two springs joined together in, in what we call in series. Okay. So what happens then if we apply a load? Well, what happens is that this spring stretches down to a new position. And that moves in the amount delta 1. And then the second spring also moves to a new position. Okay, so it moves delta 1 first because the end has moved delta 1 and then it also moves a new distance delta 2. Okay, so you understand the end, this end point is translated down by an amount delta 1. Okay, so that's this bit here. And then the spring is stretched by an amount as well, which is delta 2. And we're going to call delta equal to delta 1 plus delta 2. Okay, so that's on the graph, that's like saying this bit here is delta. So, in this case, the load W is equal to K1 delta 1, and it's also equal to K2 delta 2. Okay, so sometimes people find this a little bit difficult to get to think about, but if you think about what happens, if, if you pull this thing, if you pull, when you pull this down, essentially, this point will just equalize between these two spring stiffnesses. Even if these spring stiffnesses are different, okay, this point here will, will like just find a natural equilibrium so that there's the same level of stress in both of the springs. Okay, so you're your load is equal to either K1 times the amount of stretching in that spring, or it's equal equivalently to K2 times delta 2, which is the stretch in uh, the second spring. Okay? So we're going to set that equal to, to K equivalent times delta, 
with no subscript. Okay, so the, the sum of both of the both of the deltas. And then we're going to use that to generate a couple of expressions. Okay, so delta 1 is equal to k equivalent delta over k1. And delta 2 is equal to k equivalent delta over k2. We know that delta is delta 1 plus delta 2. So that's equal to k equivalent delta over k1 plus k equivalent delta over k2 is equal to 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2 k equivalent delta. So I have 1 over k equivalent delta is equal to 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2 delta. Okay, so I can now see that what my expression is, my 1 over k1 equivalent expression is equal to, so 1 over k equivalent delta equal to 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2. So whether you've got springs in series or in parallel or you've got them as beams or as anything else combinations of rotating and, and translations you should be able to bring them together to get an equivalent stiffness. In the notes uh, that are online on Mole, there's some other examples using masses and other things as well. But that's it for now. I'll see you on Friday for our tutorial.